I'm David Tolbert. I'm the president of the International Center for Transitional Justice, and I'm here in the offices of the ICTJ. And I'm uh, really honored to be with Tom Bergenthal. Judge Bergenthal is one of the most distinguished um, jurists, uh, really, who's around today and has a very distinguished career, both in human rights and as an international judge. He was uh, a judge at the International Court of Justice. He was uh, also a judge at the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, where he served as president. He was uh, also in the UN Human Rights Committee. Uh, he was a member of the El Salvador Truth Commission, the United Nations Truth Commission that looked into El Salvador. He's also uh, a distinguished uh, professor in his own right, where he, uh, he taught. He was the dean at the American University Law School, uh, the Washington College of Law. And he's currently teaching in, uh, back in Washington, D.C. at uh, George, uh, George Washington College of Law. It's a real honor to have him here today. And it's also an honor to have Tom on our uh, advisory board. He's a member of the ICTJ advisory board. So uh, it's good to have him here in our offices in New York. So Tom, uh, well, I Well, thank you. First welcome. of all, with this great introduction, sure. I probably shouldn't say anything more. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I'm really delighted to be part <laughs> of, okay. of the advisory committee. Thank you. Right. Well, Tom, I thought I would just um, mention, first of all, that uh, you have a book. It's not brand new, but it, it's, still, it's still pretty much fresh off the press. It's, been, it's out in the last uh, year and a half, I suppose. Um, which is called A Lucky Child. And I will say it is a tremendous uh, read. Um, it describes um, Tom's uh, childhood growing up um, in, in uh, really uh, in, the, in the midst of uh, the horrors of the Holocaust. And uh, Tom uh, spent much of his childhood in Auschwitz um, and then the Death March. Uh, and uh, it catalogs the story, um, which is an amazing story, of his living through that time period. And uh, I, I would commend it to, to everyone. I, I would just wanted to ask you, first of all, Tom, though, it's an interesting title for a book <laughs> about surviving uh, Auschwitz and the Death March and, and uh, really the horrors of the Holocaust. How do you come up with a title like A Lucky Child for, for, for that? Well, actually, uh, there's a story behind the title, right. and, and it relates to my mother when we were in 1939, right. waiting to, hoping to go to England, uh, waiting for, for visas. And my mother went to a, a fortune teller mm -hmm. in, in Katowice, in, in a city yes, in Poland, right. close right. to the, right. the Polish-German border. And the fortune teller told my mother all the terrible things that were going to happen to our family. Right. Uh, which, you know, in 1939, if you were Jewish, yeah. you, you knew, right. you didn't need a fortune <laughs> right. teller to tell right. you these yeah. things. But then she said, but you have a, it, she said it in German, she said, uh, you have ein Glückskind, mm -hmm. yeah. which in German means a little more than just a lucky child. It's right. sort of a special meaning, very special. Right. And nothing is going to happen to him. He's going to go through unscathed through yeah. everything that's going to happen. And, uh, my, my mother, when she, after the war, when she survived the camp, started looking for me. Uh, she believed it. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, this was sort of something that gave her the, the courage, I think, and the right. faith. Even though later on she said, no, I never, never believed it. Right. Uh, so that's one reason for the title. The other ti reason, of course, is I was lucky. Mm. Yes, you were. Uh, yes, in, in that sense. Right. So uh, I thought it was an appropriate title. Mm. There's sometimes problems when it comes to translations. Right. In certain countries, it doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah. And it's I, one of the things that I found so moving and interesting about the book is how you reunited with your mother, um, how you found each other, which is a, a, an incredible story and a story of luck, I suppose, to some extent, or good fortune. I, I just wondered if you might say a word about yes. that. I think I. Well, I, I should tell you that. Yeah. It's only very recently. Right. I mean, I knew the story of how she found me. Right, right. But recently, I, I got hold, I found, I was given a set of documents. It's about an inch and a half to two inches thick, mm -hmm. documenting my mother's search for me oh, all right. over the world. Right. 
uh, with different Red Crosses, different, the British military was un involved in my, <laughs> in the search, the <laughs> Polish Red Cross, right. all over. Right. Um, and uh, of course my, uh, it took my mother, we were separated, we were separated two and a half, for two and a half years when, right. when we arrived in Auschwitz. And she went, as soon as she was liberated and not being well at all, she started looking, mm -hmm. she walked to Poland. Mm -hmm from Germany, wow. walked yeah, back, right, right. and you imagine walking in those mm -hmm. days after the war. Um, and then I, I was ended up in an orphanage after I was in, a, in, a, right. in a, as a uh, mascot of a Polish army. The Polish army was under Russian control had liberated me. Right. And of course, she was worried I wouldn't remember my name, all of those things that, <laughs> that happened. Right. And uh, I ended up in an orphanage. and. The, in the orphanage, I indicated I was interested in going to, in those days, Palestine. Right. And my mother looked all over for me, and one of the search bureaus was a Jewish agency for Palestine. Oh. And somebody sitting there in an office, uh, so, you know, in those days, hundreds and thousands yeah. of people were looking for each other. Right. And there is a man at the desk before computers, which is something my grandchildren can't understand. Right. Uh, who looks at it and sees that the mother is looking for a child, and the child is on another list, and then the same name. Mm. Mm. And he puts it together. Right. So, and we were, so when you think about it, we were separated in August of 1944, mm -hmm. and reunited in December of 1946. Mm. It took wow. that long. Wow. Wow. And what she went through, right. because all the roads that she was going turned out to be negative. Right. One of the other things that's really struck me about the book, and I, then I want to move into your, um, but I think it's related to your, your international career, is really the dispassion that this book has. I mean, um, maybe not neutrality exactly, but given all the things that you had suffered, um, the kind of clear-eyed view that it has, and um, I, don't, I don't find a lot of anger in the book. And uh, I wonder if that is a, a product of the stage in life you wrote the book, or or maybe the, the training that you've had as a human rights lawyer. I was just I was interested in that angle. I, I think definitely this stage in life. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think if I had written that book, mm -hmm. say, five, ten years after I was liberated, right. it would have still been a sort of hate-filled book. Right, right. Joys yeah. at what was what w happening to the Germans after the war and yeah, all of those right. things. Yeah. Uh, but writing it 60-some years later, right. I was a different person. Right. Uh, everything looked to me, and of course the, my human rights work, uh, at that point you begin to think, well, how sh can we prevent these things? Right. And you don't think of vengeance and all of the, the, the sort of negative things that had not been my life uh, after the war. Mm -hmm. So th it helped. I think mm -hmm. uh, it, it would have been a very different book. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Uh, yeah. Which is really not necessary to tell the story. Right. Yeah. It's interesting, uh, I, you use the word prevention, and I, I wanted to wonder if we could move on and reflect a little bit of where we are today on questions of transitional justice and human rights. Um, obviously, there are a number of things that have happened. You were uh, on the El Salvador Truth Commission. There's been some 40 truth commissions now. Um, we had the establishment of the International Criminal Court which has had a bit of a difficult uh, teething yeah. period, if, I think putting it politely. Um, we've, uh, we've, we have international courts uh, on human rights, or regional courts on human rights, which you've already referenced to. Um, there's some issues on um, the Inter-American Court. So there's a, the landscape is kind of constantly moving, and we're in a bit of a different period of time than we were, say, in the 90s when we had the ICC statute signed. Uh, We've had the uh, post-9-11 sort of period, um, the rise of countries like China, which have a different, uh, a, they're very different kinds of the end of the Cold War. End of the Cold War. All of this has happened. So I, I would just be interested in your reflections on where we stand, particularly on transitional justice these days. We, we, you know, we work in, with the United Nations. We hear a lot about transitional justice. We have a lot of countries that we talk about when we're working on transitional justice, but it's a, it's a different atmosphere and time frame and, and history. And we also see that our work is required in somewhat different contexts, unlike Latin America where really you're moving from authoritarianism or Eastern Europe where you're 
the kind of post-communism era, we're called more and more to places where there's done you know, a civil war in Africa and so forth. So I'd be interested in your just kind of overall view of the landscape. I wish I had an overall view. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because it's not yeah. really easy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, because it is so different in, right. in different places. Uh, I, I, if there is one thing that sort of unifying view that mm -hmm. I have right. is that more and more I've come around to believing that the most important thing is education. Hmm. And that's something we're not, we don't do. Right, right. That's because we are lawyers. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and basically, uh, and we, we confront, of course, the reality that, that requires lawyers mm -hmm. and, and sociologists and others. Right. But, uh, and we don't have a long-term view. Mm -hmm. And I think transition in, in the law requires a long-term view. Right. Which is, uh, and I'm saying that only sort of from experience uh, looking at Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think uh, it's probably true elsewhere. But of course it takes time. Mm -hmm. So the question then is, in between, oh, right. uh, parallel with education, what, uh, what does one do? Right. And this is where I think institutions like this one comes into play. And mm -hmm. here, it of course depends where you are. Right. You can't, I don't think you can come up with the sort of thing that's going to fit everything. Yeah. Know, it has to be, one has to know the culture. And I think we've learned now with Iraq and Afghanistan that not knowing the culture mm. uh, leads to a lot of misery, mm. more than one try to prevent. Well, you you very um, eloquently sum up our approach in some ways. That is to to really understand the the, the country or the, the culture you're working in, have uh, a, a very good feel and political analysis of what's going yeah. on, and then provide comparative experiences because there are a lot of different experiences. Uh, whether we look at Latin America or we look at uh, we look at other parts of the world and try to try to bring that experience to bear. Um, yeah, I sorry, should yeah. Please, please, interrupt yeah, you for a sure. moment because that's uh, the Salvador Truth Commission was, was different. Yes, right. And it could be different because it was a small country, mm -hmm. and uh, we, so consequently we had we decided not to have any Salvadorans working with us, right, right. which is sort of contrary to what yeah, what right. you would expect. Right. But the reason for that was that uh, if we if we'd had Salvadorans working with it, we wouldn't have been able to get the information we got. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the country was so small so and nobody small. trusted anybody. Right. Um, so I, for example, the, the sort of experience when that the Truth Commission in Salvador had, you couldn't do that. In Ar Argentina, for example, mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. a, a large country right. where you s could still find people who could be trusted right. and where I things that would that were dealt with by the Truth Commission wouldn't immediately go all around the country. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, whereas right. in El Salvador, right. it, uh, one day, and that's why some of the early commissions they had failed. Right. And that's right. why, you know, tr uh, and the Truth Commission, of course, uh, in, in South Africa uh, was so different in, yeah. in many ways than, than any others. Although one thing that I found, in, uh, that we found, where there was a similarity, uh, was that when we dealt with the Jesuits, mm -hmm. who, the mm -hmm. Jesuit fathers right, right. Uh, who had been executed, uh, their brothers, so to speak, didn't want vengeance. They just wanted them to admit it, that they mm -hmm. did it, which was very similar right. to South Africa. So there right. is some the, the religious aspects. Uh, there may be even different religions, a unifying sort of cultural underlying element. Right. I've, I, just looking back at that El Salvador experience, uh, uh, you know, the, the commission made a number of recommendations, some of which were taken, some of which were not, some of which I think probably came into force much, much later than you would have liked. Is there, if you look at that experience, would you, did you think you more or less got that right in terms of the recommendations and the approach? or? Would you look back? I mean, there have been a number of other truth commissions which you've studied in the, in the meantime. What, what struck me out yeah. of that whole experience, right. I mean, it's very hard for me to say we did it right. Right, I mean, yeah, of course. Uh, 
But when we were finished, and when, yeah. they, when the generals and the leaders of the FMNI and the guerrilla yeah. were asked about it, right. the only criticism against us that they had was that we were a bunch of arrogant foreigners, <laughs> which I thought was a right. <laughs> great right. honor. Right. None of them pointed out that we didn't we got somebody wrong, that right. when we okay. named a person, right. that that person was not guilty and wasn't even in the country and so right. forth. Yeah. Uh, so we were, we were, uh, we were right. very, c we were tried to be v very careful in right. analyzing it. Where we failed is not so much that they, after we uh, issued our report, they immediately declared an amnesty. Mm -hmm. We knew that was going to happen, and that's why we made named names. Right, right, actually. right. Uh, where we failed is that we, we Salvador is now politically healthy, if you can mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. that of any right. any country. But it is totally a, almost a criminal, yeah. you know, institution. institution yeah. It's terrible the gangs that that you have. Mm -hmm. So people survived the terrible period mm -hmm. politically, uh, and they are now facing really these uh, uh, gangs, mm. uh, and that that is something we couldn't solve. Uh, we we didn't see it coming. Mm -hmm. We were worried at the time about all these soldiers uh, and guerrillas having a lot of weapons mm. uh, and no jobs. No jobs. But we, uh, I mean, I would be lying if I said we saw what was going to happen. <laughs> we didn't. <laughs> right. And we should have really, there's something in the future, uh, this is something one needs to really take into account. What do you do with these people right. after s right. such a terrible event? But naming names was a kind of was a, a, a kind of a forward-leaning uh, step that you took in the yes. commission. I mean, it wasn't explicit in your charter, and it, I th uh, obviously a key decision that you made. How did you reach that, and what were the consequences? Well, some human rights yeah. friends right, <laughs> right. accused us of violating due process. Right, yeah. Well, first of all, we knew that there was going to be an amnesty. Hmm. And we, we felt that given what we, were rep what we reported, what actually happened, and who was responsible, mm -hmm. that it would be sort of negligent mm. not to identify some of these people. Right. Uh, everybody really in the country knew who these people were, right. but they needed sort of an official stamp. Mm. The problem was doing it and not accusing somebody who may not have been guilty. So we developed a system of sort of 90% sure. Mm -hmm. and, and we developed this uh, in a way, and, and we, as a matter of fact, not named people whom one under normal circumstances would have named. Mm. Uh, and then we were, of course, accused of uh, not, uh, of being somehow in cahoots with the torture, with the people who received mm -hmm. money from mm -hmm. the torturers mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. all of those things. And you, well, in this business, uh, one shouldn't worry about those. Right. One never right. will satisfy everybody. Right. Uh, but we felt we had to name names right. because of the, and we had to name names on both sides. Right. And both sides were really quite responsible. Mm -hmm. Even though the government, it was easier to find the government responsible because of course it's a government. Right. Whereas the, the guerrillas right. uh, work differently, but they killed a tremendous num right. number of people. I'd like to just move and talk a little bit about the Inter-American uh, Inter Court of Human Rights where you served and served as president. Um, because partic particularly in Latin America, the impact has been very substantial, um, both on the impunity and uh, the fight against impunity, but human rights generally. And that system, as I think we alluded to earlier, is, is a bit under strain now. Um, I'd it, of course, doesn't exist everywhere. You have it in Latin America. In, in Europe, you have a strong um, regional uh, European Court of Human Rights, but we don't have it in other places. Uh, I'd be interested to, to get your reflections on the impact of the, of the mm -hmm. court. Um, and I think you're the only surviving member, so I want to make sure we get yes. you on the record. <laughs> <laughs> and <How you're> <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure for a very long time we'll get you back in 12 years to reflect again. But I <laughs> hope. I hope. Uh, we in, the, in Latin America today don't have the, the regimes we had in, when we mm -hmm. started. We started mm -hmm. in 1979, mm -hmm. 
much of Latin America were military dictatorships mm -hmm. or just dictators. Um, tremendous abuses of human rights mm -hmm. from Argentina all the way right. down to Central right. America. Um, then now most of the governments are democratic in, the, in quotation marks, mm -hmm. uh, some more so than others. What is curious, what I learned, mm -hmm. and I don't think many of us realized that before I didn't, it's much easier to deal with dictatorships when you're a human rights body. Mm -hmm. Because they actually take serious what you're saying. Not that they necessarily follow you, mm -hmm. but they want to appear that they're complying. Mm. Whereas so-called democratic regimes say, what is it your business to tell us? We were democratically mm. elected. Mm. Mm. And that's, that's a, you know, yeah. so they feel today mm. much more secure in saying that the Inter-American Commission is just, uh, mm. right. they're not doing their job, they're intervening, interfering right. in domestic affairs. The dictators never said that. Right. Because all, they all said, well, we don't violate human yeah, rights. Really interesting. So yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, uh, that's something that, that right. sort of I find always striking today when I hear, for example, a country like Ecuador or others mm -hmm. suddenly feel that they have a right and are justified in attacking mm -hmm. the inter-American human rights institutions. Right. Uh, that's one point. Mm -hmm. the, when, starting on the court was quite interesting because we all, of course, thought we were John Marshalls. <laughs> we were the right, first right. seven right, seven right, judges, right. and we, we really had no no precedent. Right. We we had we looked at the European uh, Convention on mm. Human Rights mm. and the statutes, and also on the international one. It was a tremendously satisfying job, particularly the first five years. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it was fighting a, a sort of a tremendous, uh, like climbing a mountain, mm. and the mountain wouldn't let you right, go very right, far. Right. But even if you managed to take a few steps, you thought, gee, we've right, accomplished right, something. Right. And so we initially only did advisory opinions. Mm -hmm. we were everybody who supposedly knew something said, oh, they're not doing anything important. In fact, the advisory opinions allowed us to lay down a framework of right, law right, right. Uh, that we didn't have in Latin right, America. Right. Um, and then when, the, when the, for example, the first disappearance cases came, uh, by that this was already in, this, in our second uh, six-year mm. term, mm -hmm. we, we had thought, we had an opportunity to really think about what the convention meant, how to right, apply right, it. Right. Uh, and then afterwards, things sort of began to flow, and more governments became much more responsive. Mm -hmm. Governments were overthrown. Uh, we had I had this wonderful experience of uh, of going to Argentina after the military regime had collapsed, mm -hmm. and a new president, first democratic president, and uh, so uh, we, I think the the biggest achievement was the decision in, in the disappearance case. Yes, right. uh, but. We also had a great advantage, and that was that four of our judges had been in prisons for different reasons. <laughs> oh, right. So right. when you have judges right. yeah. who have that experience, fortunately not for murder, or right. Right. but for political for reasons political or reasons religious reasons, yeah. reasons yeah. Right. It, it, it gives you a coherence, right. a cohesion that you don't have right. otherwise. And of course, you were an American on the l at the court that was really focused on Latin America. That's a bit of an unusual circumstance. Yes, well, I was, it, uh, right. the U.S. did not nominate, nominate you, right, couldn't right. nominate. Yeah, right. um, and, and that was in itself a wonderful experience. Right. And I spoke no word of Spanish. I'd just be um, also moving on to, you know, we have the International Criminal Court. We've had the ad hoc tribunals. Uh, we've seen this, at least in the 90s, uh, flourishing of international tribunals. and. Um, leaders being held accountable, uh, 121 individuals tried in, uh, in uh, the Yugoslavia Tribunal alone. So, but we seem to now be in a period of, of, uh, of stalling, in a sense. Um, we are now have the International Criminal Court. A couple of days ago, I don't know whether you saw it or not, the um, African Union passed a resolution that basically accused the court of racism and cooperation with the court seems to be really difficult. Where do you see international criminal justice fitting in to transitional justice? And do you see this as a bump in the road, or do we need to take the long view? Uh, or do you think uh, the, the system needs maturation? Or are we in for a really rough ride? I'd just be interested to get your thoughts. Well, I, I should, t I, 
what's happening now with Africa yeah. right. and the ICC yeah. sort of proves a, a, a sort of position that I've held, right. which is we really need regional human rights tribunals mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to supplement the ICC. Right, right. Uh, and we, we just somehow thought that we had one ICC and mm -hmm. that would sub, uh, sort of satisfy all of the regions. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in part because the ICC's jurisdiction is limited, the world probably needs regional tribunals to do other things right. as well. Uh, regional tribunals would help. Now, how you do that and how you put it together, <laughs> don't ask me that. I'm going to read the next <laughs> book for about it, right? <laughs> no, th that's not easy to do, <laughs> right, yeah. but I think it would help. Yeah. And that's why I think, for example, today we're, we may finally be ready yeah. to have a UN Human Rights Court hmm. because hmm. we have the regional courts. Right, right. With the ICC, we did it the other way around. Yeah, and right. I, and I, I also I think I've always been an optimist. I think the ICC is going to get out of this problem. Mm -hmm. okay. It's unique because, of course, actually, I think the Africans sh should be aware of the fact that they were the ones who, the majority of cases against Africa came by, the, by their own governments. Right. So right. Um, what can groups, NGOs like right. yours right. do? I, I think you're doing basically what, <laughs> uh, I mean, you're dealing right. with right. countries right. that have transition problems. Right. Uh, you do it, you you don't use the same model for for all of them. Right, right. Uh, you try to understand them, and also I, I don't know whether you I'm sure you realize it. What you're doing now will probably be the textbook uh, of ah, the future for right. similar organizations, right. because transition is always going to happen. Yeah. I mean, we have it now in Africa and other parts of it's th these things repeat themselves unfortunately. Yeah. So the text that you're going to Right in terms of your own experience, uh, will you? You don't know you're writing it, now, but you are. <laughs> okay. uh, Tom, that that reminds me of one of the early times you and I met, which was uh, when you and I reviewed the book of reparations that ICTJ oh, yes, put seen. out, right? And and I can recall being slightly. First of all, being on the panel with you was slightly intimidating, but uh, then you then you you were the first speaker, and you said. Nobody else in the room but me has probably ever received reparations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have, uh, you've been, you've covered the gamut in a sense, not just in the courts, but um, as a as a recipient of reparations, as someone who's uh, really lived the, the the experience. And I was really interested in your your opening remarks about the influence that your writing a book had uh, and the, the experiences you had as a child and how those have sort of played out in your life. So it's a great honor to have you here um, and I'm very del I'm delighted that your wife Peggy is with uh, with us as well. She's a good friend as well. So glad to have you both here for a couple of days here in New York and we're uh, we continue to be excited about you being on the advisory board and you're going to help us write that next chapter. So <laughs> good to have you here, Tom. Thanks Thank very you. much. Great okay. to be here.